Welcome everybody to the second session of the morning of this uh, PATC course. And uh, I'm Marco Verdicchio, uh, I'm from Sursara, and in this section I'm going to give you an introduction to HPC, it means High Performance Computing. So a little bit about myself. So I'm uh, working as a consultant, High Performance Computing Consultant in Sursara. We are based in Amsterdam, uh, in particular in Science Park, that is uh, this beautiful park uh, in the center of Amsterdam and where all, some of the main university, Dutch universities are. Uh, in Zorsara we are about 70, 80 people, operational people, and half of us, it's like me, consultant, so we have a research background mostly, we work with computational, but we are not um, computer scientists, not of all. And the other half, more or less, is that are system, system programmers, so computational scientists that manage our machine and our services. Because what we do at Sursara, so Sursara is part of a larger company that is called SURF, that is a, um, a Dutch company that provides ICT services to researcher and academics. SURF uh, is composed by several um, companies that work on network, uh, market, science, and SURSARA in particular, has, we focus on high performance computing, data visualization for science. What does it mean? It means that we provide computing services for researchers, uh, companies that want to use high performance computing for their work. And in this infographic on the right, you can see some of the compute services that we provide. So we offer cloud um, services, grid, uh, data analytic, and my team especially, we uh, work with the two high performance computing systems that we have in the Netherlands, Cartesius and Lisa. And this is our daily work. What we do, we mainly uh, maintain the, the two machines and uh, we give support to the user, to our user, to run on our machine and to optimize their code, their work. We also give trainings like this and also to universities and other um, Dutch organizations. But we also uh, develop computing services and new technology, for example, machine learning, again, data analytics. And we are involved in many European projects like PRAISE or Combiomed, the project that organized these trainings. So, what I'm doing this presentation, uh, I'm gonna really uh, give you an high level uh, picture of what high performance computing means, especially what is a work, uh, supercomputer and how it is to work on a supercomputer how you access, why you need it, and how to use it. In the first part, I'm going to give you also a brief introduction about Linux command. I don't know how many of you know Linux, but you need to know some of these commands in order to work with uh, these supercomputers. I'm going to show you, I'm going to go through some of the, of the, um, of the main commands that we're going to use. And then I'm going to show you how to run your code, your simulation on a supercomputer. Again, this is a really uh, high-level presentation showing general idea of high-performance computing. You can apply these ideas to uh, all the supercomputing that you have access to, all the supercomputers, not only on Mare Nostrum, on which we're going to work today. So, what is a supercomputer? Supercomputer are this beautiful machine here, we see a picture of Cartesius, the main uh, system that we manage in Zorsara, and Mare Nostrum. I don't know if you had the chance to go and visit the Mare Nostrum supercomputer, but it's beautiful, it is in, an, um, is in a chapel, and uh, it's really um, well kept. So what is the main difference of, between a supercomputer and your laptop or your workstation at work? Well, first of all, it's a different user experience. Your laptop, it's yours, you have control of the laptop. Here you're working on a remote machine that is multi-user, so many people connecting and use the same machine as you're doing. 
As I told you, you need to know a little bit of Linux because uh, pretty much all the supercomputers run a Linux, Unix OS. And uh, the software that is installed on the supercomputer is optimized for the architecture and the topology of the system. What, what, do, you mean? what, I, what do I mean with the topology of the system? Supercomputer, it's a huge machine. It's, in, it's composed of a lot of many CPUs interconnected with fast interconnection to exchange data attached to very um, efficient memory, large memories. And sometimes you have also specialized hardware attached to the supercomputer, so GPUs or FPGA and other hardware. I'm not going to go into details of the hardware and uh, the, all the specific. You're going to have a training this afternoon, I think, more focus on this. Here again is more how you're going to work and what you can do with, uh, with this uh, supercomputer. And, uh, and again, it has also a large storage attached. So you have a larger disk, uh, very efficient, with backup, um, designed for parallel I.O., for example, efficient uh, parallel I.O., etc. So as I told you, these computers are large machines that are composed of many cores, many CPUs. This is uh, a list taken from the website <coughs> www.top100.org that lists the top 500 supercomputers in the world. Here you can see the top five, some way highlight in China, and you see here it has 10 million cores. So the machine has 10 million CPUs interconnected that you can use part of it. Or, and uh, yeah, you see the top five are all a very high number of uh, cores, these other. And uh, how uh, these computers are ranked? Basically, there is a um, specialized software called LIMPAC. It's a library, linear algebra library, that is run over the full system to measure how many operation, floating point operation per second the computer can achieve. And this is an indication of the power of the computer and the supercomputer. And here you can see the R max. This is the peak of this uh, number of operation per second that the computer can do, achieved through this LIMPAC. And you have also R peak, that is the theoretical peak, the theoretical capacity of the of the system. And uh, yeah, you can see that the order of measure of this is teraflops, so a large number of floating point operations per second. So what's the difference between Rmax and Rpeak? So Rpeak is the actual theoretical peak. So you can measure, I'm uh, not explaining here how you can measure the number of floating point operations that that actual CPU or system can do. Of course, this is theoretical because you always have some connection, delay, latency, etc. So the R peak is the theoretical, the R max is the one that is measured by running this LIMPAC library on it. Isn't the speed of uh, clock uh, relevant? Clock speed? Yes, Isn't yes. The, yeah, there are a, a lot of things. Also, the architecture of the core itself can change the number of operations that can be run per second. So, yeah, this is. Okay, it's an indicative number that gives you the idea. It's to rank this computer, is widely accepted and used. But that doesn't mean that this is the best supercomputer super for your application. It depends from a lot of things. And we will see that a supercomputer is composed not only by CPU, but a lot of other uh, really important piece of hardware that we need to take into account when we work with a supercomputer. So one question, why I need or when I need a supercomputer? Well, if you do uh, computational research or you're involved in some um, work with the software, you may want to scale up from your local machine where you're working now or from the local cluster. Uh, what do I mean uh, with the scale up? Well, maybe using like faster CPU, like you say, like higher clock, 
or more uh, newer, better hardware architecture, mm -hmm. you may want to use larger memories. Maybe your computer is not big enough to store your data and to analyze all your data. Or in some cases, you may want to use GPUs or other specialized hardware for, for example, machine learning or other, um, other type of work. But this is not the only reason. You don't go to a supercomputer simply because you want a more powerful computer. You may want also to scale out. What does it mean to scale out? It means that you're not actually looking for more power in the single chip, but you're looking for a lot of cores, a lot of CPUs that can work together and can speed up your simulation. And usually there are two approach to this. You may have a, a Parallel application, that's an application that runs as a single application over a lot of CPUs, and these um, can share data, communicate between each other, and work together to speed up the simulation. So for example, I imagine uh, domain decomposition. You can decompose the domain of your problem and uh, divide the calculation on these uh, subdomain different CPUs, then then uh, communicate to each other to collect back all the, the, the information at the end. Or another approach is you have a lot, of, a lot of small or medium jobs that if you run sequentially, that means one after the other, is going to take forever. So you want to have a lot of computing elements that are working at the same time on different, uh, on different jobs. This can be done by, for, for example, parameter sweep or Monte Carlo simulation or this kind of uh, simulation when the process, they don't actually need to talk to each other all the time because every calculation is independent from the other, but you need a lot of them. Okay, so now we got an idea of why uh, when you need a supercomputer, uh, how it is working on a supercomputer. Unfortunately for you, it's not anymore like this. This vintage picture were beautiful, but working on a supercomputer now is not like this. We are not sitting there and next to the machine. Working on a supercomputer nowadays is more like this. I'm sorry for you. You spend a lot of time in front of these things that is called terminal. So as I said, the, the, the supercomputer is in fact a remote machine. So what does it mean? that? You're not sitting next, or you are not actually typing on the machine, but you're connecting, you are the user here, through a specific protocol or mechanism tool to the machine as a wall. Imagine this right part of the picture is the full supercomputer. So you see this through your terminal. In reality, behind the scene, there are a lot of components. You are actually connecting to a machine that is called login node, and this is the machine where you actually are when you enter the supercomputer. You submit your job to another part of the supercomputer that is called batch scheduler, that interact with the resources, etc., etc. So there are different components, and I want to give, I want to go through these quickly now with you to have an idea of what. Um, what they are. So, as I said, the login nodes are uh, computing elements, so nodes, the actual node with many cores too, where you log in. You're actually not supposed to use these uh, nodes for uh, um, running your application, but it's more for uh, editing and transferring files, compiling small programs, or prepare the input of your simulation. Since this is a remote machine, all the data you're going to use, all the input file, need to be transferred to the remote machine. And you can transfer to the login node. Once on the login node, as I said, you submit your uh, simulation, and I'm going to show you later how you do set up and prepare uh, your, um, your job, to a batch scheduler. A batch scheduler is a software that is installed on the machine that is aware of the architecture, the resources behind the scene, so the, the CPUs, the hardware, etc., and uh, basically provides for you the part of the resources that you need, and uh, is also um, queuing your job. What does it mean, queuing? You, as I said, again, I reinforce the idea, you are on a multi-user machine, so there are a lot of other users at the same time running 
as you are running. So what happens if you submit a calculation, but there are there, two people submit a calculation at the same time? So who get allocated first? Who get the resources to run the, the simulation first? This is the batch scheduler that does this. And there are several ways to, to how we decide who gets first and which resources to allocate, but he take care of this. And it also does an important thing that is accounting, because on this machine you usually, you don't have a limited time to run. You have a certain amount of a CPU hour, that means uh, one CPU hour means that you can use one CPU for one hour. So when you apply for an account on a supercomputing system, you usually get an allocation that can be million of CPU hours. And depending on how you use it, you need to consume all these hours uh, by the end of the project. And the batch scheduler take into account this. So every time you run, you run for one day on a CPU, he detracts 24 CPU hours from your, uh, from your um, account. And then uh, there is the, the the main part of the supercomputer, the hardware that does the calculation, that is the compute nodes. So these are similar to the login nodes, but are reserved for your simulation. So it's where you run the, 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 um, your software. You don't access directly the compute node. You can access, and we will see how a little bit later, when it gets allocated to you. And, uh, and then it's where it runs your simulation. So our multi-core, usually large memories. And because of the concept that I explained you before about the, the parallel application that needs to communicate between each other, these nodes have high speed interconnection between each other. So really low latency and very fast connection that lets you let the two compute nodes communicate to each other efficiently. And then uh, File systems, we have, as I said, like large hard disk, uh, very fast, efficient for parallel I.O. In Mare Nostrum, we will see you have also node, compute node local disk. These are disks that are local to the compute node, are not shared across the, the system, and are fast, and you may use them uh, for your simulation if you need to write a lot of data or read. These are very fast and large um, file system attached to the node. So what did, so in, we have seen now the, 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 the supercomputer, what is a supercomputer, how it's configured, but when it comes to run your job, how, it, how you run your simulation. So I divided, the, the procedure can be divided in three steps. So again, remote machine, so you need to log into the machine, protocol to transfer file to the machine because you may have your input files or any other file you, you, you need. And then, as I say, you get this terminal and uh, you interact with the terminal through the command line. So you're basically going to type commands that the machine, the OS, going to interpret and do something like run your application or move a file or create directories, etc. Once you are in, you prepare your inputs, and here you not only have to prepare the input of your simulation, but you have to prepare also what is called a submission script. That is uh, a file that tells to the batch <coughs> scheduler which resources you would, may need. And then when you get allocated, it tells to, it's a sort of recipe step by step of what to do on the compute node. We're gonna go through these and, uh, and I show you a little bit how to, to write this job uh, submission script and uh, to write, uh, uh, in general, a, a bash script, a uh, Unix script. And once everything is ready, so you log in, you have your file, um, your software, you may need to compile your software or you may need to retrieve the software that someone else compiled for you or that uh, sysadmin or consultant like me installed on the system for you. Once you have everything ready, you are ready to go. And then you can submit your job. So again, you submit to the batch system that then is gonna allocate the resources and run their, uh, your simulation. You can monitor the job. This simulation or um, these jobs, they usually take times. 
So, and on top of the running time, you have also the queue time, the time that you are in the queue waiting for the resources to be available. You can monitor these uh, from, from the login node, from using the, the batch scheduler. And then finally, you can retrieve your output. So once the calculation is done, your, the produced output is going to be on the supercomputer. You may want to retrieve it, to save it locally, uh, send it somewhere else, or many times perform some post-processing or visualization. Supercomputers are equipped to do remote visualization quite easily, so you can also visualize or um, edit the output on the supercomputer. Okay, so um, we have seen a little bit, a big, like high level idea of how a computer, a supercomputer work. As I told you, um, you need to know a little bit of Linux uh, in order to play with the supercomputer because its main OS is Linux. So, uh, question, how many of you know Linux? Linux command, okay. Yeah, don't worry, I'm going through a basic introduction to, to Unix command too, so um, you can follow even if you don't know anything. If you know something, maybe a lot of the commands are gonna be uh, repeating. I'm gonna repeat myself, but again, all more or less, I, I'll try to go over more or less all the command, the Linux command that we're going to use today. But please, I would like to keep this interactive. So please, if there is something you want to see or there is something you don't know and looks strange, please stop me and ask me. Uh, okay. Uh, so I prepared also for you some uh, hands-on, some... Uh, small uh, script to run, uh, some more robust example. You can get everything I'm showing you today and also the presentation itself from this link. I can actually type it somewhere. Okay, uh, it's there if you, quite easy, patc underscore hpc. What this link is gonna bring you to a GitHub page. GitHub is a software for uh, um, version control, so to, to, to manage files and share files, etc. And basically, how to get the files you find there? Here, you press on the click or download, clone or download button, and it will pop up and tell you if you want to download as a zip, and it will download all the files as a zip, or you can clone as a git. It's a little bit Mm, clone means that you basically get a copy of the full working directory on your local cluster and you can uh, track changes of file, etc. You don't need this at this point, you can simply download the zip file. Um, okay. Mm. So, log into an HPC system. First thing, you need an account. That's not trivial because I told you these machines are uh, not open to everybody. They're really expensive and uh, it's dedicated to research, so, so to research. So you need a way to get an account. Luckily in Europe there are many ways to get you on board, especially if you're a researcher on an HPC system. There are, for example, European funded projects like Praise that is organizing this training or Combiomed. The, the, the other European project I'm working with, that is that they have uh, resources and can give a location to their uh, um, collaborators or uh, people that work in the project. There are also national initiatives, like so. The, usually, the National Research Institute provide also can provide compute hour on a super on the national supercomputing through in application. So. We have, uh, in the Netherlands, we have the NWO, so a researcher can write a small proposal to ask for uh, compute time on our system. It goes through an evaluation process, and if it's accepted, you get granted the allocation. In here in Spain, I think is the RES that give you, can apply, so check the RES uh, website. Sometimes 
your university may have a special agreement with a computing center, like in, in the Netherlands, we have uh, several universities that have uh, uh, um, preferred access, so basically they get, allocated, they get allocation easily for students and researchers of the university. And in any case, the best thing to do when you would like to run on a supercomputer is to contact the support team. So like me in Amsterdam, here at BSC, there are people working maintaining the machine and consult on the work to help users. And then again, help you and guide through the procedure of application. Again, you have to, usually you have to write a proposal explaining why you need the supercomputer. Uh, what you're gonna do with the supercomputer and for how long, etc. So, but practically, what do you need to log in to an HPC system? Well, as I, again, you need some Unix tools. So, uh, I show you the terminal, for example. You need a terminal emulator installed on your machine in order to be able to talk with the terminal on the supercomputer. You may need uh, graphical tool that lets you um, visualize things remotely. Log you see the, the image and the, um, all the visual locally in your machine, but the image and all the things are actually generated remotely on the, on the supercomputer. And many other tools, like tools for uh, file transfer, for example, etc. So for Windows users, usually <coughs> Mobile Xterm is a very useful tool comprehensive, it has more or less everything, or PuTTY, it's a small, smaller tool for uh, um, only SSH, so only to connect to the system. macOS user, they have a terminal, is pre-installed, so that's okay. If you want to do um, visual, remote visualization, you will need uh, uh, an X server, like XQuartz, it's one that you can install. And uh, if you want to transfer file through a graphical user interface, also you may need to install specific code like FileZilla, CyberDuck, WinSCP, etc. For Linux user, you are all set. You are already well equipped. Since you are talking to a Unix machine, you don't have to install pretty much anything. Unless you want a graphical user interface, these are usually not by default installed on the system. All these tools, again, is to get this, the terminal. This is the, the same I showed you before. This is local to my machine, so it's not remote, it's not the terminal of the supercomputer, but through this, I'm gonna type through the command line here some commands that uh, will allow me to connect to the supercomputer and run my jobs. So, the first command that I'm going to show you is how the, the command, the tool that is used to connect to the machine. And this is called SSH. So this is one of the protocol. SSH stays for Secure Shell. The shell is actually uh, a part of the OS uh, that gets the command from the command line, really high level, and pass this command to the, the kernel to the OS that then execute this. So, Secure Shell, this tool that is installed on your, uh, on your machine, is, uh, it lets you establish a secure connection to the machine, because again, it's a remote machine somewhere else. You need to be sure that y your connection is secure, otherwise you may have a um, man in the middle or some other attack that can uh, intercept your connection. So, Secure Shell is uh, secure, it lets you authenticate, so as I told you, when you log in on a supercomputer, you have an account, and uh, an account with a budget, and um, um, files on the file server that are reserved for you. So there, we need a way to authenticate. When you connect, you tell the, the, the supercomputer that it's really you. The supercomputer check, and they give you access if it's confirmed. And finally, the main part of the shell, of the SSH, you, you can pass command. So you type command locally on your machine, on your keyboard, and these commands are sent to the, to the supercomputer that then execute. So how you connect 
fir first command. Here it is, uh, here it's a screenshot. Actually, you can copy and paste this test. So even later, if you want to try everything I'm saying, once you have the presentation, you can always repeat. So this is the screenshot of the command line. And uh, so this is the prompt. Forget the dollar is where the line start. And uh, here, I type SSH. And then my username, in this case, is NCT00. I miss a zero, actually, four. And then at, and the address of the login node you're trying to connect, or the machine you're trying to connect. That is the uh, address for the Mare Nostrum login node. So um, Mariano told me that when you sign, when you sign the, the paper, you also got a number, sequential number, and that is linked to an account on the Mare Nostrum supercomputer. So already, if you have the tools I showed you before, so Mobile Xterm or Terminal or uh, um, Putty installed on your machine, you can already try and log in to, oh, sorry. Problem with the OK. You can already try and uh, do the first things and log in to Mare Nostro. Once you type this command, again, here, please remember, change your username. Uh, use the one got assigned to you. So NCT01 and then the sequential number. The password is, so after you type the command, the prompt is going to ask you for a password. You will see this password and empty. And be careful, you type and nothing happened, but in reality you're typing password, so it's not show you that you're typing. And you type your password, that is hpc-eeab dot and the sequential number that you got. This is the way how the system authenticates you. So you're saying to the machine, I am NCT0004, in the back the machine has recorded somewhere that Marco Verdicchio me has this account, and I got the password assigned, like you. And typing the password confirmed my identity. Um, so thi this is not the only way to authenticate to supercomputer. So this is called symmetric encryption, user password. So you, you use this system, a single password, for uh, authenticate you. There are more sophisticated and uh, useful way of authenticating to an HPC system. This is just for information. You don't need this uh, second way of uh, authenticating, but it's good to know because a lot of time are the only way you can access machine. So this other way is called asymmetric encryption. It works with a system called uh, public private keys. Basically, what does it mean? You really, uh, again, high level, not in the details, but locally on your machine, you generate a couple of keys, unique. So for uh, each private key, there is a unique public key. You first need, for the, the first time, you need to log in to Mare Nostrum using username and password to authenticate the first time. But once you are in, you copy in a specific way to specific path. Again, if you're curious to see how it works, you can Google uh, uh, SSH key pair or uh, asymmetric encryption. You will find plenty of instruction how to do it. But basically, you're copying the public key to the remote host. So how this work? This work in the way that uh, you can encrypt a message using your public key that you can freely distribute to everybody. Everybody can wants to or needs to authenticate you can have a copy of your public key. That is why it's called public. You don't need. So other people can, um, can sign, can uh, encrypt a message using your public key. And uh, you only the owner of the private key, and this should be only you, so you can distribute the public key but not the private key. So only the owner of the private key can decrypt the message. Okay? So in this way, you have another authentication factor. 
So I'm sending you a, a encrypted message. You are the only one that can decrypt. So I know that if you can give, tell me back what was the content of the message, I know that it's you. And this is a way to, to, to authenticate user. It's in this behind the scene is much more complicated and there are a lot of other factors, but this is high level how you, you can um, log into to a supercomputer, to an HPC system. Okay, so we have the tools, we have an account, we, have, uh, we know how to log in, so let's go. And voila, when you type SSH, username at uh, mn1bsc.ls, type your password, you're gonna get something like this. This is the, 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 the login node. You are logged on a login node. You can see here, login one. And this is the message of the day's code. This is a message that is printed every time you log in. There is already a really important information here. Please read the user guide. It's sometimes like user try to log in directly, not reading and say, why I cannot log in? I type my password is okay. And then maybe somewhere is specified that you cannot log in directly to that node or other things. Here uh, you can find the, the Mare Nostrum user guide. Every HPC center, every system has a user guide where you can find the information. And again, if after you read carefully the user guide, if you have other problems, you contact the support. And okay, so you're logged in in Mare Nostrum. Let's have a look at what supercomputer, what computer you're using. So Mare Nostrum is a beast with uh, more than 165,000 CPU. Very, very powerful Intel Xeon Platinum. There's these memory, I'm not going in the detail of the hardware again, but these are all uh, um, very efficient, like cache memories. You have uh, 96 gigabytes of RAM on the regular node. There is a set of compute nodes that are called like, memory nodes that have even more. This is the type of inter interconnection. I told you it's really important to have a fast interconnection between the compute node. That makes a lot of difference because most of the job that you run on a supercomputer, they're not confined to a single node, but they try to use a lot of computing nodes. And you, may, you need fast interconnection to exchange data. And then uh, uh, hard disk, more than 390 terabytes of hard disk and 200 gigabytes of local SSD um, on the node. Available, temporary, this is, I'm gonna, again, go through the, the detail of this, but again, to, to understand. This, this 200 gigabyte doesn't sound like a lot. It's not the total memory of the system. This is on the top right. This is a, a fast hard disk, solid state disk attached to the compute node. So when you get allocated the node, so when the batch scheduler say that, okay, this compute node is for you, you can use that hard disk, as I told you before, to store and retrieve data, um, put the data, the simulation output, etc. Once your job is done and you are not allowed anymore to run on the node because you, you already did your work, this memory is cleaned. So it, that is why it's temporary. And it's only accessible during the job. So we will see something you need to remind to copy back the data. Okay, let's get started a little bit with some Unix commands because you are logged in, you are in interface, you are facing with this Linux uh, system. So what to do? Okay, so first of all, Unix. What is it? It's an OS. Maybe most of you know. So it's main part of a computer, control the other parts, allocate resources and uh, allow the user to interact with the system. It's a multi-user and multitasking OS that is 
important for uh, supercomputers. Again, the supercomputers are a multi-user system. Um, are, is designed to be machine independent, is very well equipped for software development, and one of the reasons why it's widely used is because it very, works very well with a lot of scientific applications, the structure, how it is, and because most of the scientific applications are designed to run on Linux system. So, after successfully, hopefully you successfully log in to the system, what you get is this prompt. Uh, it changed a little bit. You remember the one I showed you before? In my local computer, it was simply without these parts. Here was written local. Here now you have some, you have more information. You have your login name, your login, at the host name, which, where you are connecting, this is the name assigned to the, the login node. So this is convention here, BSC, they use login one. In uh, search data, it's called int one, etc. But And now here you have the prompt, and this is the command line, when you can type your commands. And the system now is ready to accept commands. So you type like before SSH, uh, and then you press enter. And that it run the command. Okay, let, let, let's see something. Again, please, if you wanna know more of commands or other things to play with, ask me and that's all. But I'll try to go through this command and then. So let's try to run the first command, like date. Date is actually a program that is installed on the computer, on, the, on, the, on Linux, and then print the date and the time of today. So typing date, enter, the, the shell, the, the, the terminal, tell to the OS to call the program date, run the program date, output of the program date is this, and print the screen. And then give you back the command line. So you can continue, type other command. So a little bit more, you name, minus A, you name it's another tool to print like uh, the name and the characteristic of the system. And voila, again, call the command and you get Linux, the name, uh, version of the OS, type, date, a lot of information. Ah, but here there is something else. It's not only the command, I type you name and something else. So that's how Unix command works, you type Command, then space, and you can have, uh, yeah, this is the structure of the, the Unix command. This is another command, make, make deal to create a directory. So you have the command that tells the Unix shell, uh, bash in this case, to, to find the program called make deal and execute. You may pass option to the, to the command. Usually, Everything that is after the command that starts with a dash or dash dash are called options, flags, that are um, optional parameters that you pass to the, to the executable to change its behavior. So for example, to come back to the example before, here dash a minus a means all. Give me all the information you know about the system and that's what is what the program has. If you try, if you're logged in, try to type you name without a minus a. You will see you don't get this list of information. You get much smaller because it prints only the default information. And uh, some commands, they may get optional arguments. So for example, I imagine if you have a, a program that runs with an input file, usually you execute it by doing name of the program, space, and the input file. That tells the program to work on the input file. The name of the input file is an argument. And uh, they may be optional, or maybe you may need, you must put an argument, otherwise tell you, come, uh, need an argument. And, and that's all, that, that's the main structure. And few things is important, it's case sensitive, so, MKD is not MKD with the capital M is not gonna work 
because it's a different command than mkdir or lowercase. And then spaces are used to separate commands, options and arguments. As I told you here, command, space, the number of space between the command doesn't matter, and then space and the argument. These, uh, be careful in something here, that especially for Windows users, so if you have a file, imagine the case before I was telling you. You have a code uh, that needs the input file as a name. What if I, the input file has a space in the name? My data, separate. This is maybe problematic if you copy and paste directly to Linux. There is a, the backslash, it's an escape character that tells the bash that the next character is a special character. So, for example, if you want to type a name of a file with a space in between, you should do first part, backslash, second part, slash, back, second part. Um, okay, so I already told you several things, and we saw only two commands, and there are already three options. So where, where, where you can find some help uh, uh, regarding the command. Actually, Linux helps you itself. There are ways to know more about the command you're running. So, one way, for example, is to use another flag. Another flag. This case, this case is, doesn't start with a single dash, but it's dash dash. There are flags like this. There is no, this is more a convention, it's not that um, there is no real need of having like uh, one or two. In this case, help is recognized as a dash dash help uh, the, the, um, to ask for help. Otherwise, there are other command. This is, depends from the command. Other command except the dash h flag. Um, but there is, this is not the only. So if you try, you can try this. And it's going to give you a lot of some information about you, you name uh, um, command and also all the flags that the, the command accept. There, are, there is also another command in Linux that is used to get information about commands. And this is called man, like manual. So you ask for the manual of your name, and it will give you a page with all the description of what the, the, program, the, the program does, how to run it, example sometimes. Not all the programs have a manual page, but most of the Linux commanders. Or you can also have uh, info or other uh, similar command to help. But the help flag and the man are the main two. Yeah, okay, yes, this is, I also, this is, for example, the, the manual page of your name. I don't know if you see, but it tells the name of the god, how you use it, Description, print certain system information with no option, same as S, minus S, and they'll tell you all the options. So minus A is for all, only the kernel name, only the non name, etc. And this is usually the case of all the commands um, in Linux. So let's, let's see some other commands, okay? Let's play a little bit. With the machine. Sorry, I don't know why that. Let's play a little bit with the machine. So, again, here I'm going through the command, really simply telling what they do, not going to the details. If you have a question, you can try eh, all of these on the machine yourself. So, first of all, let's look around. So, how you ask where you are in the system? You're in a folder, subfolder on the main home directory you get. So command pwd, present working directory. Bam. This is how a file system is displayed in Linux. So this means that there is slash is the main um, folder in Unix, the root where all the system then is installed inside. Then you have a, a folder called home that contains many folders. One of these is NCT00, the other, and then inside this, there is an NCT00004. That is my own folder. So 
as soon as I log in, if I type PWD, you should get something similar to this with your login name and some other file. So let's see which files are there. LS, list, is a command to list the files that are there. And voila, these, these are two log file, text file, and folder called bin. You can get more information from LS using a flag, L, that is long format, and tells you more information about the, 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 the system, the, the, sorry, the files. Uh, you can change directory with the CD, so you can move around. You want a CD into dir or sub dir. You want to you wanna go back one level, dot dot tells it's, it's it's um, tell the CD command to go one folder up in the hierarchy. So here, you see the inside dir sub dir, so two folders inside. And you want to go one level up, well, and you are in dir. If you want to go back to the home, that usually in, uh, in Unix is also, you can also, is also represented by this character tilde. You can simply CD without any argument. It brings you back to your own folder. That is the main part of. Um, about this, a small addition to this, moving around and looking around. Relative path or absolute path. So have you seen, like in Unix, you have this hierarchical system in which you have folder inside the folder inside the folder. If you want to, for example, a list a file, you can list r the file relative to your current position. So in this case, I'm in my home, and I want to list a file inside dir. So I do ls dir, it's a subfolder of my home folder, and the file is inside. Or you may be somewhere else and you want to still list the file, you can use the absolute path. That means it's the path that starts from the root folder. So again, instead of giving the relative path to your position, you give the position of the file relative to the, the, the root folder. And this is like, like, for example, this. Again, this tilde I told you, so it's basically the path of my home. So this is the absolute path of the file my data. So it's home. NCT uh, inside dir my data dot out. You can make directories like mkdir. Okay, here not a lot of fantasy. I got a directory dir. This is a name. You can give any name. The command is mkdir. Make dir. You can remove a directory rm dir only if it's empty. If you wanna remove a direct a directory and this content, you can use rm remove command with the option uh, dash r and remove recursively. Be careful using this because if you, <laughs> I'm not sure you want to remove all the file. Unix in this way doesn't ask you if, you, are you sure you, it's not like um, Windows, are you sure you want to clean your uh, trash or empty your trash. Here if you run this command, uh, unless the file is protected somewhere, somehow, you remove all the files that you can, okay? So be careful in using RM uh, in general. Okay, you can uh, copy file, copy directories, or remove files. Again, uh, command cp, here takes to argument, copy this file and rename it as a file one.copy, copy a directory, here I used another, this is star, this star is a wild character, that means this basically say, tells copy every file that starts, uh, the name starts as file one, and whatever extension is, the wild character tells whatever is there, copy all the files that match that pattern into there. You can move a file, Move is also used to rename files, so if you want to change the name of a file, you move the file simply like you copy, but instead of using copy, you move. And then um, another 
important thing is remote copying. I told you before that you're working on a remote machine. So if you want to copy a file from your local folder to the remote machine, you can use other command called secure copy. There are many commands, SFTP, FTP. This secure copy is like a shell that does a copy command remotely. So same things. Needs a little, on top of giving where you're copying the file, you need to give also the name of the computer you're copying the file to. And then uh, you can do the way around, copying from the supercomputer back to your current directory. Another thing here, okay, I introduce a lot of small things about dot in Unix, in Bash, is the current directory. So if you do CP of an absolute part of a file somewhere and you want to copy where you are in that moment, you do CP, the full path, and then dot. Dot means here. It's really like semantic, you know, copy this file where here. Copy how recursively the char this file there. And you can also copy folder, of course, with the recursive command. So you copy a folder directly to the, to the host. Okay, I'll show you. We saw some commands, basic commands, really basic yeah. commands. There are plenty of Unix commands. Here I'm listing some that you're going to see in the in the following of this presentation. And, uh, but there are commands to editing file, for system tool, you see, you name it, there probably there is a command. And um, okay, so now I told you how to run interactively, one command after the other, but what if I want to run a lot of commands? Or and maybe also in a workflow fashion, so that I run one command and then get the output of that command and rerun it, use as input as another. This is possible with Unix. It's actually one of the um, strengths of the system. And you can do it using script. So basically, it's, it's uh, like in a movie, actors as a script. So like um, something that tells you how to act and what to do. Here you, have, you write your own script file that tells the, 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 um, the OS what, what to do. And you can, it's a basically, it's really, it's a text file that you can, you can put inside as many commands as you, you want. And it's like the same command that you're running on the command line, you put in the file and then you execute the file. What does it mean, execute the file? It's a text file, I told you. Yeah, it's true, it's a text file, but in Unix, files are like, the behavior of a file is, um, is controlled by what is, called what is called file permissions. So every file has a nine permission bits associated that tells who can read, who can write, and who can execute the file. So for example, for a folder, execute means that you can change into that folder, you can CD into that folder. And so I, I told you, read, write, execute. So why nine? Because you have three permission bits, so three level of permission per three are for you, the owner of the file, and are the first from two to three. Three are for the group. So you, in Unix, uh, it exists this concept of Unix group. Basically, are several login under the same group. So they have these, they can edit or they have the same permission on a set of files. And this is determined by the other, um, the other three bytes, three bits, um, permission bit. And the remaining three are for all the other users. So uh, for example, this file one.txt. OK, ah, there is also, sorry, I forgot. There is an initial additional bit that is not for permission, but it tells you simply the type of file. So if it's dash, it's a regular file. If it's D, it's a directory. You see here these two. So for example, this file one. First three, I'm the owner. I can read and write. All my group can only read, and all the other users can only read. 
Of course, you can change the, the behavior of this command. There is another Unix, of, uh, sorry, of this file. There is another Unix command that is called chmod that tell you, lets you change this permission. And basically, if you have a script that here I call symbol.sh, you can give execute permission to the script in a way that then you can simply run it, like dot slash here, the script, and you run it. OK. Yeah. So let's see some batch scripting, OK? Let's start with some interesting stuff. Again, uh, you get all the training material from the link uh, before, same link. You can transfer, if you want to try now, to Mare Nostrum using this command. In the link, you get also the presentation. So if you want to download it and maybe to copy and paste command, you, you can actually. It's, I put the presentation as well. This is for um, Mac OS or um, Linux people. If you have a Windows, you can use Mobile Xterm or WinSCP. And then once you transfer the file, you log in and you can extract with the command unzip. Okay, you get as a zip file and you can extract it. So, again, well, uh, can you see? Otherwise, I can. Anyway, this is a bash script, a very simple bash script. So, first of all, first line, it's a special line that tells the OS which interpreter is going to read the command that follows. So, this script. You can write a script. This is a bash script. So you tell the, the, the OS that the following command are bash command. But you can write a Python script, for example. And here you will specify some Python paths. And following all Python commands, and you will get um, <coughs> executed. So again, don't, don't focus too much on each command that is here. You can always man and the name of command. But let's, let's try to understand the structure of this, uh, what this script does. It's really basic script. So ego, it's a command that prints a screen, something, a string. So here, I'm saying, I'm, hi, I'm your first script. And ego without anything, any argument is simply blank line, OK? Then I call a command, lscpu. This actually lists the characteristic of the CPU you, you have behind yourself. With a flag, help. And I redirect the output of this command. So whatever output come out from this command is redirected to a file that is called cpu.log. And then I run the command. I don't want only the help of the command. I want actually the output of the command. I run the command, and I redirect the output to cpu.log. Why this time I have two arrows? Because it's redirect and append. So the first um, lesser than or greater than arrow to the right. It's uh, create a new file if it doesn't exist. If it exists, you'll over write. If you want to append to the, the, the end of the file, you use the double. And then it prints some other I left something for you. you. You can try and run it and have fun with it. So again, why I was talking about redirecting it? Because in Bash Unix, you have uh, like every program has three predefined input outputs. So there is what is called the standard input, and this usually is your keyboard. So if a command needs some something in in input, you type the command, and you will get an empty line that is waiting for your input to type, and then whatever is printed. A uh, whatever is produced is printed a screen. That is the standard output, normally. Also, the error, it's a separate flux. You can redirect the error to a file and the output to another file. Um, yeah, and then you can redirect a file. Uh, you can redirect output to a file as an input for another command. Here is a sort of pipe of, uh, of commands. OK, so I show you the, the sample. First example is uh, very easy. You have a slightly more complicated script into, um, 
into the, the unix.intro advanced.sh is a more advanced script. Um, let's not look let's not look at that now. You can if you wanna you can uh, you can take a look by yourself and maybe if we have time we can look together at the end. But it's all commands as as I show you uh, before, it's a little bit more complicated because you have redirection, multiple commands, other things that can be printed. Please download, and if you have any question, ask me. So let's focus now on, OK, we learn a little bit of Bash, OK? Let's say we know how to run commands and how to run on a supercomputer. Now, let's see how to run job, because it's not that now that I know Unix, I can run job on a supercomputer. I told you. it's. Slightly more complicated than working on your local machine because you're logging in to a login node that is not actually the node where you're running the software. You don't have to run. You don't. You, yeah, you cannot run on the login node. You have to communicate with the batch scheduler, and then allocate resources. And you may want to move around to file system to use the best of the of the system capabilities. And the main actor here, as I told you, when you need to run a job is the batch scheduler, the batch system. Again, this is, all supercomputers use a batch system because computing resources are connected in batch and multi-user system that every user needs to have the possibility to run and allocate the resources. So instead of Prepare, running interactively as we did now, like dates or uh, all the commands, you prepare your job script. Your job script is a bash script, like the one I show you, plus some other uh, information. And the uh, are information about the resource you need. So this is something, when you run your code, you need to know in advance what you need. So I want to run my command uh, on two processors. Okay, I think, I suspect my run is going to last for two hours. And, but I need uh, three terabytes of storage and this uh, memory, okay? These are all the characteristics that then tell the scheduler which resources to give you, okay? And you have to specify this in the job script. Then, once you specify this, you submit the job and the batch system is responsible for allocating resources processor nodes to your job. Slurm is the batch system um, used in Mare Nostrum, also in Cartesius and many other um, centers. There are a lot of batch systems, a lot, several batch systems, and everyone has his own command set, but the principle you learn here are applicable everywhere, and there are, it's really easy to find the respective command for another batch system, okay? Question? Yeah. Yeah. So, if you are wrong in the resource, uh, speci the specification of the resources, the batch system knows and it tells you. Uh, I cannot grant this allocation, or yeah, it, it simply cannot grant the allocation. If, uh, for some example, you are already in the queue and some resources are not available anymore, you can check the status of also the, the the batch system that the resource is not available. If you're wrong in the scripting, that's your fault. That's you that you, and that's why you have to be careful where you are, how to run. It's like, really, when you write the script, you have to be careful that you have the input file, where you need to run, that you're redirecting to the right position, because the batch scheduler does know that it doesn't know what you want to do on the node. So you think that all the things you wrote after your bash script is correct. So you have to specify uh, CPU time? Yeah. The CPU time, that, that's, that's a tricky part instead. Uh, you need, so since it's, again, it's, a, it's not like working on your own computer. So you cannot get a compute node for undefined time. You always need to specify time because you're working on a shared system where you're not the only one to use the resources. So when you submit your job, you have to tell for how long you're going to run and for that. Uh, this is a tricky part because a lot of people 
run the simulation, specifying one hour of CPU time, and then it's actually the simulation takes longer. In th that case, the batch scheduler kill your application. So everything is running is killed, and, and you're going to get a log message saying that the uh, vault time exceeded vault time. And in that case, again, it's unfortunately it's your fault. You specify a uh, too short uh, compute time. There are two things you can do. Rerun with a longer vault time. Or if your code allow, you can set up like checkpoints and restart the simulation. This is something usually scientific codes allow this. So even if uh, you may lose not that much, but not all. So it's always useful to understand, have a good idea of what you're going to run on the system, OK? So it's not that, OK, I ask for 10 minutes, and uh, let's see. Because if the simulation takes 12 minutes, you, don't, you won't get the result. Yeah. Okay, so again, uh, when you look into the supercomputer, you are on a login node, okay? You don't have access to the compute node, but of course you, you say, why well, I cannot log run on the login node? Because the login node is basically a compute node dedicated for user login. Uh, when you run some, you're not supposed to run long job on the login node. Uh, when you run, when you try, there are several things like HPC Center usually put like um, limit. So if you use uh, more than one processor on the login node for more than 30 minutes, the job is killed or uh, other things. So without the batch system, you cannot run on the compute node because you cannot really access the compute node. You can run only on the login, but you're not supposed to. And usually there are measures to, to not allow you to run there. Yeah, okay, so I already said this, the batch system allow you to run many job at the same time. Why we use this? Or it allow many user and queue system, so not who get first, first allocated, but it's based on a lot of uh, um, factor. And this is because also to have a good system load balance. As I told you, <laughs> it's a multi-user system again. Uh, you may get like imagine I'm a heavy user and I'm using half of the of the comp of all the system, okay? And then you arrive and you want the full system. And then after you another user, it wants only one compute node for a small amount of time. Why not let this user first before you that you're still waiting me for ending my calculation on half of the system? let run before you and when it's over. Yeah. So that all these movement to get a good load balance and a good like occupancy of the system are managed by the, the batch schedule. And that's why it's there also. Um, yeah, uh, when you run, there are like, in the system there are many other things like uh, to take into account, there are queues. Queues are basically, um, portion of the system that are or like specific like queue for uh, user that have a specific purpose. For example, for this training, we got um, a reservation of 768 cores. Okay, that's for us, for this training. Only user from this training can access that. And that is displayed as a queue. So basically when you run your simulation, you tell the batch scheduler, I want to run in this queue. So not, don't put me in the line with all the other users because I have preferred access. Or I want to do simply debug. So debug has a maximum time of two hours. And uh, so why there are specific queue to, to manage like load balance, et cetera, OK? And uh, OK, so how to submit a job script? Here it is. There are commands, Slurmas commands, every batch schedule has its own command, to submit job to the queue system. So you will have batch and the job script. It will submit your job script to the queue system. 
S Q, it will show you, it will show all the job you are you have in the queue. S cancel to remove a job. S run is to run a command of all the resources allocated. And then there are again, uh, guys. Here, uh, these are list of some commands. If you go on the website of Slurm, you get many more. If you type a man of every of these commands, you get a lot of information. I'm not going into the details of every command. I'm going to show you, hopefully, some, some example at the end. So Then there are the directives, the, 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 the information you have to put in the job script to characterize which resources you want to run on. Okay? So here are they, they usually um, appear as a command, like as a comment like this. And you have, uh, you can express the number of nodes, the number of tasks per node, the number of, the, how, how long you want to run for, the queue, and other information. Like here is pretty, is pretty how many tasks per node, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so now let's try, okay, I'll try to, show you something, okay. Well, so SSH, NCT, okay, let's log in to this. Can you see it? Okay, log in, type my password. Wrong password. I me ah, okay already. What was wrong? Wrong username. Hopefully. Okay, let me try this. Connection timeout. Can you guys log into the Mare Nostrum? Ah, okay, so probably the, the system is down. Okay, it's working, huh? Okay, what happened, basically, there are several login nodes. You see, there is MN1, MN2, and I think MN3 also. So I was trying to connect to MN1, and probably that login node was down because it was connection refused. So I simply changed to another address, MN2, to get the, the, the file done. Okay, so let me copy from somewhere. Yeah, you can put four, but then you will be asked for <laughs> my password. No, no, no. Um, MN, do you have put MN4 or MN1? No, 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 it was... Uh, ah, I was using a wrong... Uh, no, I don't understand your question, sorry. Um, ah, okay. So the, the MN123 is the, the sysadmin that gives that name to the machine. It's the login name of the, the host name of the machine, okay? These are predefined, and there are three, MN1, MN2, and MN3, okay? You can connect to one of the three. And that is the, the, the name, the host name of the, the computer. The NCT00004 is my login name. It's my login, it's like this one for you. So I'm saying Marco Verdicchio and CT00004 is connecting to MN1. I changed MN2, it's another trying to connect to another login node simply. Okay, so 
Uh, no, 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 usually you have account on every, on every login node. It's not, it's simply the access point. The accounting, the, the authentication is, uh, okay, let's do. Okay, uh, I don't know if you saw, I unzipped the file. I had the file there, the file I, I gave you with all the instruction. So let's see, it has the folder. Unix intro, run jobs, presentation. Oops, sorry, I was run jobs. Inside the run, uh, sorry, batch here. Okay. Uh, if you see, this is the folder batch sys that it, con it contains like two slurm submission file, this is uh, the job descript file, and uh, interactive.txt is uh, some information for you if you want to take a look to how there are ways to run interactively on a compute node, and that's, that's how you usually do. So, here it is. Uh, I hope I hope you can see this otherwise. Okay. So this part, as you see, this is the job this script where you specify where, uh, how you run your job. So basically, this tells the scheduler which type of resources you need. What is the name of your, uh, of your um, job? How long you want to run for? and where to put standard output and error. It's going to create a file uh, with that thing. So first line, the job script starts with the directives. So these uh, slurm specific directives to where to run. And then this is like the best script I showed you before. So again, echo, why am I, who am I? These are other commands. Who am I prints your username where uh, host name, it prints the name of the host where you're running. And then this is lib 600. It's for uh, like um, wait. So it let, it let the process sleep. And OK, so what happened? Okay, I think there are some problems with the machine because now. Is there a timeout on, on any one of the nodes where you don't, if you don't use a terminal for a few minutes, it uh, times out? Freezes? Uh, no, I don't know. I think, yeah, you see, there, there is a. I think now there is a problem with the, the machine because I was uh, editing the file and I got blocked and now it's connection broken pipe so there is something and there was this problem with MN1 so I don't want that there is some down of the machine right now where we are running. Usually there may be some, some there is usually sometimes that if you're idle it's automatically dis disconnect you in the system but it depends these are the system mean how the system mean uh, manage the system. In this case, I don't think it was so short. This for sure is not the timeout in this case because actually I was editing a file. So now I'm trying to again connect. Uh, oh, okay. That doesn't seem to work even MN2. I don't know if it's my connection or. But my case I even have to uh, yeah, yeah. This when when it remain appended, if doesn't time out, some sometimes you the only thing is Control C. If you type Control C, it's to kill uh, the process, art kill the process. But sometimes even that doesn't work because you're not connected to the process anymore. But anyway, this stay here. It's how the script is. So I was open to. Okay, there is uh, 
you can you can play with it and um, and there are like uh, they're bought in the the the, the material and uh, you have uh, the one I show you is a Slurm one. It's a submission script that, that you just saw. There is another, a little bit more sophisticated script. It's really simple too, but it actually asks for multiple nodes. And it runs a command, it uses sRun. It's a batch, it's a Slurm command that is aware of the resources available behind you and is able to run um, the, the, the commands you put after sRun or all the resources you, you're gonna use. So in this example, for example, you have a sRun host name. So it will run the command host name that give the name of the host on every node you got allocated. In this case, it's a two node job. You can take a look uh, at that. Um, another important thing about supercomputers on top of the batch scheduler, so far we have seen all Linux command, okay, basic commands that are used to uh, interact with the system, manipulate editing file, but when you run your simulation, you're not using usually bash. You use uh, more sophisticated software written in C, scientific languages, C, C++, Fortran, Python. So where do I get my software? Okay, first, if you are a developer or like a, a expert user, you can use, you can compile your own software. But the supercomputer comes with a software stack, some software already installed in the system by, um, by the system mean most of the time. So it's also optimized and aware of the system in the back. And how user can use this software installed there? Well, this is done through what is called environment modules. So modules is a software, it's a tool in Unix that um, basically when you want to use uh, an application, you load that application, the module of that application. What module does is set up a lot of internal variable and uh, construct that are needed in Unix to run the application so that after you load the module, you are able to use the application like it's installed for you. And uh, in this way, you can get on the system programming languages you may need, compiler, specialized libraries, or scientific code too. How you use this? Okay, so there are right commands that you um, can run to get. So for example, module avail, it lists all the modules available on the machine. I wanted to show you, but okay. Wait a second now. Let's try with a new one. Okay. Okay, now it's working again. Cool. So, um, module, so how you get your software? Again, module and then some other command. Let's see. Let's see which software is installed on um, Mare Nostrum. So module avail, and voila. And this is, you see, you may recognize some of the codes you're using, Gromax, uh, everything. And these are all the codes installed already in the system. There are more compilers, other things, libraries, etc., tools, and that's, so what if I wanna use, I don't know, Python? So you have also default, so you see for uh, software you may have uh, several versions. If you do module, uh, if you want to load the CMake, you can choose a specific version or if you don't mind, there is a default and you will load this version. And uh, so let's see, module load Python. Well, it tells you that it loaded Python 3.6.1. And it set, again, I told you this, what it does is actually setting a lot of variables and, and stuff behind that lets you run Python. And how I can see that are, so once it's loaded, I can use the command, the Python command, it, the program, and I can type Python, and I have the Python command, you see? Wait, let me. 
So again, Python. And then I ask for which version of Python I'm running. This is one of the flags that I was showing you before. And this 3.6.1, the one I loaded. So now I don't want any more this version of Python. I can unload Python. And I want another version of Python, maybe 2.7.13 that was installed. Loaded again, this time, if I run which version, I have loaded a different version of Python. That is what modules allowed you to do. So you have many versions of the software installed on the system, and you can load and unload and use the one that fits more your work. Okay? This is the concept. Then there are a lot of other uh, commands you can, you can run. You can check which version of a specific package are available. You can list the module that you are installed. There are a spider for look for modules, a lot. Again, man module or module dash dash help or Google are your best friends when you have a new command. This is lmod is the version that uh, is used in um, in uh, Mare Nostrum. Okay, yes, I already showed you this. I forgot I had uh, printed the module lists, which Python. You can ask which Python is installed. M load Python. With which, it's another command that tells you which executable you are actually calling when you run Python. And this is the full part of the Python executable. And you get the uh, the full software stack. These are the one module available. Okay, so we saw the batch scheduler. We saw the software stack, so more or less you, and batch scripting, so you should have more or less everything to be able to run on a HPC system. Before actually running, it's good to understand also which file system are there and how to use that. So. Every system has its own uh, um, different configuration. This is Mare Nostrum, is, for example, has three main partitions, let's call it. One is the root file system that you don't access, is where the OS is installed and the application is installed. Then there is a GPFS, it's a, um, a, an EBM file system that is distributed, uh, um, efficient I.O., and um, it's suitable for a supercomputer. And this is where all the main files, your ROM are, your, uh, all the files you put into the machine gonna be, etc., etc. And then, as I told you already, there are these local hard drives in the, on the compute node. As I told you, the main file system is this uh, GPFS that is actually divided in different uh, parts. You have uh, the apps folder that contains all the application and then this is, is there. You can list the application that are listed to get an idea but you should not, you, you should not get a, have access to that folder. And then you have home, project and scratch file system. These are different, are all on the same GPFS system but are different are for different purpose. So home, I already told you about home, is where you log in, where you have your file when you log in immediately. Project is a specific uh, folder designed in Mare Nostrum to host file that you can share with other people. So project has a group folder. So you have uh, your user, as I told you before, is part of a Unix group. In, when you have an account in Mare Nostrum, you get also your group get a folder in this project file system and uh, you can put there files that you want to share with other people because other people in your Unix group has access to this folder and it's a way to share file or to have like same software working on the same file and like that like that it's intended to store data that needs to be shared and then there is scratch Scratch is useful for you when you run your simulation. It's a file system that is um, uh, distributed over all system. You can see it from the login node, from the compute node, and is where you should 
put the temporary file that your code is generating, okay? And, um, and it's not, backup and is usually cleaned um, regularly, so it's not meant for long-term storage. It's only for temporary files. It's maybe you have, uh, your code needs a lot of parallel I.O. or a really, so that is default. Um, okay, uh, again, uh, there are uh, several inputs, uh, several um, examples that I prepared already. Let's see if I can get. Okay, uh, I, I think there are like, a I don't know if it's this connection, because maybe uh, the connection here is not. Uh, Excellent, and it drops, and then it freezes. This, for example, you saw I left this open, and it's still there. Uh, okay, so yeah, I, I think that the login will stay for the rest of the of the um, of the training even more. I don't know how long. It so if you want to play with this, you can keep playing. It's not only for two days. Three days. Three days. Okay. Um, okay. Again, I have uh, other. Uh, okay, this is a more sophisticated submission script, as I told you before, and these make use of uh, one software that is installed, Python. It makes use of the Scratch Deer, and uh, it does a lot of other uh, um, small things that you should get. So let's go quickly yeah, through this. Again, don't focus too much on the single command. If you have a question, ask me. But all of these, if you Google it, or if you type man and the command, you will get many more information than I can give you. So don't forget, let's, let's try to understand the structure again, and what, what you do, and what are the, the things you need to do. So again, definition of which resources you need. In this case, it's a sequential, so only need one processor. You load the tool you need. In this case, Python. You set up your, uh, I, I set up my Scratch. So this is the, the, the path I was, I was telling you before. GPFS, Scratch, the name of my group. This is a variable in Bash. It's called, it are built-in variables. So Bash, the shell itself, set some variable that you can use or that are used to influence the behavior of the Bash. This user is a, is a variable. And with dollar in front, you get the value of the variable. That is your username. So basically, here I set up a folder like this. Slurn job ID is the, another variable set by Slurn this time that contains the job ID of the job. And that's all. Submit. This is the current directory. And then what I do? I create my folder. Because this is present already, but this needs to be created because I want a specific folder in my Scratch. So I create a folder in Scratch. I copy my executable. I have an executable, pairwise, pairwise that calculate. You give um, an array with uh, n m particles for each particles the, the position x y z. This uh, Python script calculate give you back a matrix M by M uh, with all the distances, reciprocal distances between the points, the pair distances. It's a really trivial code that does some calculation. So I copy my executable into Scratch, and I move into Scratch. So I CD into Scratch. In a way that everything that I produce, every file I produce, I will be, uh, they will be already in the Scratch. OK. Freeze. Um, okay, that, that's the. Um, no. Okay. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. But again, uh, okay. Uh, one second, I'm trying to get the same script uh, from uh, my local computer so as I can show you Python 
Okay, this, this is the same, we were not able to run it, but it's, it's okay. So again, uh, we were here. Uh, again, give executable, ex, ex, ex permission to the executable. And then here it's, I did a small trick to uh, trying to time how much it takes this application to run when I run it, how much really this code it takes. So it's really easy. There is a variable, built-in variable in bash again called seconds. Seconds, when you start the bash, it starts accumulating second integer in this variable until the bash is over, okay? So at any point you can ask the value of this second to get from how long this variable was started, the bash. What I did is a small trick. Before executing the command, I set this variable to zero, so I reset the second, and this does, the, the bash still accumulate on that, but it starts from zero instead of the time when I started the script. It's a very bad way to calculate time because it gives you like, a, it's not exact, it doesn't give up, but it's to show you that um, you can do something like that. So you get to zero, at the end of, after the, after the execution, you get the value and record it to time, copy back results to your final folder and print some other running time, the print, the, the, the time it ran, and the uh, ego, and say ciao. Um, okay, uh, let me, I have a good, still 10 minutes. I wanted another thing uh, I wanted to show you. Okay, wait a second now. Okay, so that was a, a serial job, okay? That was not parallel, it was a serial running on a single CPU for the time we take it. And that is, it can be, that is, okay, uh, this is a really basic introduction to how what parallel computing versus serial computing means to let you understand better what means when you run on multiple nodes or when you run on a full node, not a serial program. But I, I'm not going into details of any library or technique used to parallelize. Again, you're going to have this afternoon, I think, a section on um, parallel programming and algorithms, so much more information. But simply to tell you, if you have a problem, you can divide your problem in several sets of instructions. If you execute one instruction after the other, like this, it's serial computing. And that was the bash script, that is what it does. In the, way the script I show you, you have a command, after that another command, after that another command. Imagine I want to perform the pairwise uh, um, uh, code, run it for 10 input files, okay? If you do in a serial way, sequential way, you have to wait the first that finish, then start the second, etc., etc., etc. One thing to do is to use the parallel nature of the node of this machine to distribute this problem. So again, you have a single problem, you divide the instructions, each instruction is independent from the other, so why not one CPU start the first instruction, and in the meantime you can use other CPUs to start the other instructions, okay? So that's, this ideally will uh, speed up your calculation proportionally to the number of uh, CPU that you can use. Okay, let's, let's see a really, again, basic example in, uh, where I am? Okay, wait a second. Okay, so, again, this is, okay, again, I, I prepared for you a submission script. You can run all this file, you can run directly straight up from the, from the material that I gave you. So if you have any, if you want to try, modify, please go on. So this is the same as before, same input file. The only thing I changed, it was dim here, before it was 500, I think, it was, is the input file. And there was only one value of input file, so I was performing that pairways on a, 
a vector of particles that was only 500 particles, okay? And I wanted that calculation, that's all. In this case, I want to do one on over 1,000, another calculation for 2,000, another calculation for 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. So, and you see, the, the problem gets even bigger. So, if I do sequentially, I will wait all day. I didn't change anything else, but we can tell the bash to do that in a parallel distributed way, task farm way. And the, the same as I was showing you the picture before, so if you have like, uh, again, let me, if you have a five input file, why not have five CPU working at the same time of that input file to produce some data? And uh, how you do it, this in Bash? Bash has a really nice uh, um, functionality that is that you can put process to the background. What does it mean? When you were typing um, a command, any command, you were basically on the, on the command line, you were waiting for that command to be executed, to finish, in order to get the prompt, the line, again, and able to run another command. If you, after a, a command like this one, this is calling pairwise for uh, um, an input and redirect the output. If to a command you put an ampersand at the end, after the command, you will see that no matter how long it takes for the command to run, you will have the prompt immediately back. That doesn't mean that the command has already finished or that is killed or this is, the command is running in the background, okay? And you can background as many, as many processes you want. I was clear, did, did you understand? That's the same as the, the picture I show you. Distribute over the number of CPU. So you have a five CPU, you need five computation you start your bash scripting and you start the first computation and you put in background. And then you get, another, you get back the command line in the immediately. The computation in the background is running, is producing data, is doing whatever you ask them to ask it to do. You get another command line. You can run another command and with the ampersand and it goes in the background again. And you can do this. And all this job will be um, distributed over the number of CPU that you have. Be careful that if you do this 100 times and you have only five CPU, you will have uh, processes, two processes running on the same CPU, so slowing down each other. So needs a little bit of orchestration, needs a little bit of thinking, but this is a really effective way to, to, to run uh, on, a par on a supercomputer. No communication, no interchange of data, every task is independent from the other. And here I did all these things that seem so complicated in these four lines. That all the rest of the script is the same, except that I have a four input instead of one. And I use another construct of Bash. Bash has a lot of construct, if, uh, uh, for loop, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't go into this because it will take a day only of Bash. But this is a for loop. And it basically loops for every uh, input number that I put in that dim uh, variable. So it was 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. It loop, and so for i in, uh, it's really semantic. So for every i in the list of value, do give the value, the first value to pairwise, redirect to this output, and put in the back. When you put the process in the background, what, that, what happened? That it goes immediately to the second line. Again, the process is not killed, it's running in the background. And it goes in the second line. This done, go back to the for loop and get the second value that is submitted again and put it in the background. And do this for four times, for all the, the, the input you gave. What does it, what, what's happened? But if everything is in the background, this, the code is going to be here, is, is going on. If the loop is over, it, it's going to go on. But you have still process running, okay? So you have to put the, this weight here. That it waits that all the process in the background are done before getting the next instruction. Why you need this? Because again, you are, in a, you are behind this uh, batch scheduler. You have uh, an allocated node. 
So if you reach the end of your script, uh, the scheduler will think that your job is over. It doesn't check if there are processes in the background running. There are many processes in the back all the time running it. So if you don't put the weight, this will spawn five, four, I don't remember how many, process running in the background. But when this is, is going through, it goes, it will tell you that there is no output, uh, and finish, and you will be over uh, with this process still running. So this is very important. You have to wait until the job is done. Um, Uh, yeah, because uh, uh, time is uh, actually the best tool you can use. And on the serial one, uh, I could have used time. So if you run these two examples, the serial and the parallel one, it will show you that uh, if you use the largest input file that you use for bot, it's going to be the total time, because you don't have sequential. Okay? If I will do that with time, I can put time in front of a command. OK, here. Then I will get the time of only that command, not of the full five process running. With, leap, with this second, it's much less accurate. I, I told you it's not a, bad, a good way. But you get the actual uh, wall time that passed from here to here, not the time that this executed. OK? I don't know if I was clear. Because that was to show that basically running five process in the background in parallel it will take, the, the full calculation will take as the longest one, okay? Because all the other will finish before and the longest one. They start all at the same time. The, the fastest finish, the long one, takes, takes one minute to run the 5,000. After one minute, you're over. And that's the same duration as a, sequen a sequential with only one input for 5,000. But in this case, I ran five. OK? That's really something. Is there a way uh, with a simple script such as this one to actually pick your processor? Uh, ah, good question. So usually this is something like uh, that the OS manage, like uh, thread affinity or, or thing. Yeah, yeah, or yes, OK. Uh, um, there for sure there is. I'm pretty sure there is. I, uh, Good question. I'm, I'm not sure. I should uh, probably bash. It's not the. It's not. Uh, no, I don't think bash has. Uh, it, uh, then maybe I'm not sure. I, I can check, but for you. Okay. So okay. That, that, that's that's. Uh, I show you the the parallel, the ampersand and weight. Okay, and that, that is a kind of parallelism. That is a way of parallelizing your application. And this, this one, task parallel. So you have many independent runs. It needs orchestration. So in my case, orchestration was the for loop and the wait. There are much more sophisticated tools to do this type of orchestration. Because in my case, it was also easy. I had the five input files, five processors. Okay, so I distribute one each. What if you have uh, hundreds? Uh, input file and only five processor. Okay, ah, you say easy. I do a round robin. I s the yeah, but you don't know which one. If you don't know which one is gonna end it first, you may end it up with unbalanced load. That means that imagine one CPU get all the fastest run. Okay, and one CPU get the extreme case, and one CPU get all the slowest. The first one it will wait idle, doing nothing forever. There are tools to manage load balance and distribute. So first finish, the first process who finish, get another one. There is a tool in Unix, very powerful, that is called Parallel. It's a new, that does this in automatically really beautiful way. You'd say Parallel, J4, and an input file, and a list of parameters. And it automatically um, assign one parameter to each of the process that is running, and the first who finish get the second one. On Gartesius, we have another uh, in-house software called Stopos that does this also intranode. There's an, there are many tools, but the, the important thing is that you need an, or an orchestration. Thank you.
get more information about them. So if I click into this machine, see her. Should show this information. Uh, this is the name, where it's running, the subscription, an ID, my public IP address, the type, it's Linux. I can get a little bit of statistics about it for the last, you know, one time, CPU, network. And then there's all of these things down here that I can do with the machine as well. So, for example, if also I made this machine by hand and then afterwards I wanted to get code from it, if I go down and click on automation script, what it will do is it will show me the whole machine and the configuration as code. So this is in JSON uh, code at the moment. And uh, maybe if I don't like it in the, um, so Azure has its own template language, it's JSON formatted, it's called ARM, Azure Resource Manager. It's basically JSON description of the machines, so you can see the details there. But actually, if I don't like it so much in that format, and I want it in the CLI, then it will show me in the CLI. Or maybe I want it available in PowerShell. So show me, show me how to make that machine in PowerShell. There are all the PowerShell commands to make that exact machine. If I want it in .NET, this is the .NET code that I would use to create the machine. So this is a very powerful way because maybe you go in and you tinker in the portal with what you want first of all, and then when you're happy with it, stick a pin in it, you're done. You know, get my code, take it, delete everything, and then I have my code that I can recreate the whole thing with. And even for reproducible research, if you guys are making papers, doing simulations, and you've uh, the machines that you use to make the simulation, if you keep the configuration for this, at least the whole thing can be repeatable. It can be shared with somebody else a lot easier. So this is the infrastructure as well, type like of thinking that you can have. So of course then you can all do different things with the machine, so you can set different backup and recovery options as well. So okay, we won't go into some of these maybe now. And different metrics and things like that that you can have. And so this is just kind of a little bit of a, a little bit of a picture of what maybe Azure looks like, um, and then on the command line maybe you can interact in a different way. So let me see. I, I know we're coming time to the end. So I want, is there anything else in particular that I'd like to show you, and or like to discuss? Okay, I might show you the cycle computing thing now just in a second. So basically, when we talk about um, and this. I'll make available these slides and the labs online if you want to choose it, but um, from moving from uh, Azure IaaS to so HPC IaaS, so if you're basically making HPC infrastructure as a service, or you want to use the HPC PaaS service, our Azure Batch service, or if you want to use HPC Software as a service, more like the Uber Cloud thing I just showed you, these are the different things that you could do. In HPC IaaS is where we have a lot of interest. People like to still have this control. They like to make their own clusters, their own machines. This is where we have maybe two different options, two different tools that are available. So one which I'll show you now, and I'll do a little demo, is this CyclePad tool. So this is maybe where you, either as an IT organization, you can own it and give this panel to your users, or maybe you as a user have this to run and deploy your clusters. This is free, completely free, right? So. Uh, when you're, what you'll do in Azure is, um, and is you'll pay for what you consume, the compute, the storage, and networking. That's what you'll pay for. But a lot of the other services, some of them you'll pay for as well. In HPC, CycleCloud is free, Azure Batch is free, the Microsoft HPC Pack is free. So when you're using those tools, you, you'll basically get them for free. So there's a lot of really uh, great capability available for free, and you're just consuming what you need. So I'll show you a demo of this in a second. The other one to mention is traditionally uh, Microsoft had a product, a Windows product called HPC Pack. A lot of financial institutions still do this. So it basically is a queue management software and resource management software. So you have a bunch of Windows machines or Linux machines um, controlled by a Windows machine. You can have queues, you can um, have a nice little GUI to submit jobs. Um, so because this also is free, a lot of financial institutions pay a lot of money to IBM for their scheduling software, so they don't need to do this. Maybe it isn't quite as advanced as that, but this is still working free schedulable software that can schedule jobs, run jobs. And uh, so a lot of companies like to use that in particular, particularly if they're very Windows centric. Um, okay, let me jump into a little bit then about 
Okay, let me show you the cycle. What it's like to create it. Okay. So this is actually something you can run on your laptop, if you like.